bless you. I want to have us get back into our study in Mark. We are in Mark chapter 13. Please turn there. We'll ask the Lord to help us. Mark chapter 13. Father, would you help us understand your gospel, this Lord God's study, and what it means to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, so that we would discern the times we live in and how we should properly respond. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in the time when Jesus entered into Jerusalem at the triumphal entry. We saw him go to the root of Israel's problem, to the temple where they had turned the Father's house into a den of thieves. They had become so religious that they missed the Messiah, the truth itself, right in front of their eyes. They tried to question Jesus, trick Jesus. They couldn't stump the Messiah at all. And so now we see Jesus leaving the Temple Mount and begin a teaching. And I want you to remember what the Gospel of Mark is all about. It is a training manual for the disciples or those who follow Jesus. And in this training manual, as Mark is closing it out, ending it up for that Easter week, he gives us this discourse on Jesus' teaching on the things to come. What all disciples of Jesus must be aware of and how to prepare the church for its final days. And so we come to Mark chapter 13, where Jesus begins to discuss the end times. So I'm going to take you through that. We start at 13, verse 1, and it says this, And he came out of the temple, and one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones, what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. That's a pretty striking statement. Uh, These disciples by now know that whenever Jesus says something, it's going to blow their mind. And so they're looking at the Temple Mount. They're looking at Herod's temple that he rebuilt from when Ezra and Nehemiah had reestablished the temple Uh, After the Babylonian captivity, Herod came along and built a grand temple. It was still actually being built while Jesus was there in 30 AD, 33 AD. And they're seeing the stonework, the gold on the roof and the gold plates on the sides of these huge stones that you can still see the foundations in Israel at the Wailing Wall. And, and the, the white stone that was quarried for it and the limestone so brilliant in the sun, they're walking past the temple and the disciples say, this is awesome, look at these stones, they're huge, they're immovable, this is our time, this is our season. Huh? Because the disciples knew this is Jesus, Messiah, now the temple will be restored, now we're going to have Jerusalem back. Jesus gives them the news. Look at this, boys. You think these buildings are going to be here? Not one stone will remain on another. Little did they know that he was literally speaking about some 40 years later in 70 AD that the building would topple and fall. They didn't have that expectation. Well, as they go off the Temple Mount over to the Mount of Olives, which is down one hill and up the other side of a large mountain hill, It says that they sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. You can see the temple mount from the Mount of Olives. And Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when all these things will come to pass, and what will be the sign when all these things are accomplished? Now, you have to understand something about the disciples. See, they just heard Jesus say these stones are going to come down. So their question is, when is that going to happen? in reference specifically to this temple falling apart. When when is this going to take place, Jesus? But they ask another question which they think is paired to the first and to the temple's destruction. They ask the question, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished or completed? They didn't realize they're asking questions that have to deal with his first and second coming two different times. So Jesus is now going to answer their two questions in a present tense and a future tense, laying one on top of another in his answers. 
What he's going to say has prophetic significance for 70 AD and the destruction of that temple in their present age and at the time that they're around. But it will also have an impact at that second question, when will be the signs? What will be the signs for the accomplishment of all things? He tells them about the end of days, but they don't recognize that, but it's written for our sake so that we can understand as disciples and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ how this thing's going to end. And so he gives us seven signs in the next number of statements, to tell us what's going to happen at the end of days for the church or the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, let's take a look. The first thing he says is, number one, there will be false messiahs. And he begins his teaching and he says, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. So there's going to be false teachers, false messiahs, And there have been since 2,000 years gone by. How many of you know that? There's different teachers, different cults, different groups. Some that say they're the Messiah, they're the Christ, they're the anointed ones. So there's been many false teachers. And what he says is this to the church, to his disciples, let no one lead you astray. Well, how do you get led astray? Anybody? When you don't know where you're going. You are left off the path. You need to know the Word of God. The only way you can be led astray is if you don't know where you're going. And so the followers of Jesus know where they're going, know where their Savior is, and know how to get there. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. But false messiahs messiahs are going to lead many who are blind astray. Oh, if there was a light in the earth that could lead people in the right path. Hmm, who could that be? Could it be the church, the light sitting on top of the hill, not covered by a bushel? Could it be the salt? We are that light to lead people to the truth, to the Lord Jesus. There will be competition against the church. It will be the false messiahs and the false teachers. So don't let anyone lead you astray. And don't let anyone lead them astray. Be the light, church. Be the light. Amen? He then goes on and says something else will happen towards the end. Nation will rise against nation. He says this, And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. Everybody say that. Don't be alarmed. You need to say that to yourself quite often. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. This is not the tribulation. Not yet. So you're going to see nations go to war and fight. Because it is the time of the Gentiles. It's the time of human government. God is going to allow human government to have its folly. Nation to raise up leader and leaders to follow any way they can through brute force and might, fighting each other till they finally decide to combine together under one leadership, the ultimate false Messiah who is Antichrist. But there will be wars and rumors of wars, and there have been for 2,000 years, haven't there? Some of you talk to folks who were around in World War I. They thought, hey, man, this is the end. World at war, all nations coming together. Talk to those of World War II. It just was a continuation of World War I. It just got worse and climaxed with Hitler, a false messiah, one who really imitates the last days. But it wasn't then either, was it? There were other signs that had to come. So there's always going to be wars and rumors of wars. And again, he says this, don't be alarmed. To the first false teachers, he said, don't be led astray. To the wars and rumors of wars, he says, don't be alarmed. These things must come to pass. We don't like that. We don't want nations to fight against nations in war. We want peace. We want to preach peace. We want to live peace. But these things will take place. But the end is not yet. All right? Well, then he goes on and he gives another sign. Sign number three, he says, natural disasters will occur. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. 
So now natural disasters, earthquakes, uh, arctic caps melting, tornadoes, hurricanes, stars and comets falling, and all sorts of calamities in the earth that are taking place. So you've got false teachers, messiahs, false leaders leading people astray. You've got nations in wars and rumors of wars and natural disasters. All of this, he says, is the beginning of the birth pangs. Now, how many of you ladies have ever had a child? And what is the beginning of labor? It's pain, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, well, is it? The worst of times or the best of times? We could have a little uh, maybe debate here this morning. Some of you say the best of times because that manifestation of that child is coming forth. But it's the worst of times because it's a real pain getting there. Right? But this is exactly what he's saying. The earth is convulsing. We see it. Don't you see it around you? And, and, and the, the weather and in all sorts of things. And, and everything he said as signs that are coming towards the end. They're increasing and increasing. But he says these are the beginning of birth pains. Signs of his return. Everybody's seeing it as the end of the earth. You look at every other movie coming out and it's the end of days it's the apocalypse it's it's zombie uh, and ufo invasions and death to the planet and who's going to live we all need to fly to mars and exist longer and find some place in another planet it's the end it's in the air can you breathe it can you feel it it's everywhere why is it in the air because it is the day and it is the season it is the time and it's happening, and the birth pains are beginning. Now, he adds something that's going to come with this, false teachers, wars, and uh, natural disasters. He then goes on to say to his disciples, so be on your guard. It's coming. It's happening. Now, in the first century, he's telling them these things are going to take place. Rome the Romans are coming against Jerusalem. There's false teachers. There'll be natural disasters and so forth, and you'll be persecuted. He says, be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in the hour, for it is not you who speaks, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his child, uh, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all men for my name's sake, but the one who endures till the end will be saved. So there's persecution coming to the church. Persecution coming to his disciples. He says the gospel must be preached. So what he's saying is this. Even though there is resistance to this gospel, even though there's persecution to the church, you have a job to do. So there's going to be wars, but that's not your concern. There's going to be natural disasters, but that's not going to stop you. There's going to be false messiahs. Be on guard, but don't let it stop you. And there's going to be those who are going to persecute you and put you to death. But there's, that's the only thing that's going to stop the church is silencing you by death. But you will not be silent because the church will continue on. For even the gates of death or the gates of Hades shall not prevail against my church, says the Lord. This gospel will be preached to every nation to the end of the earth. Hallelujah. It will take place. They were persecuted in 70 AD. Every one of the disciples was martyred. And the early church was persecuted. But something else is taking place here. He's speaking on into the future to all disciples of the Lord Jesus. And he's saying there is a time coming when there will be false messiahs, but ultimately the false messiah. There will be wars and nations warring against each other, but they will war to such a place where they will be gathering together to war against God. 
and there will be natural calamities that God is going to use to drive people to their knees so that they will turn to the Lord. But the persecution for Christians will increase. Why do we know these are the last days? It's because the 20th century was the bloodiest century for the church than all other centuries in church history. More Christians have been killed for their faith in the 20th century than all previous centuries put together. It's increasing. It's coming. What of the 21st century? We see what's already begun. And so what is the church to do? The church has a mandate, brothers and sisters. The church has one mandate. To be blessed and prosper to your favorite needs. That's what the preachers tell me. This is your day. This is your hour. You get it your way. And that leaves a weak church not ready to endure what it is charged to do. He gives us warnings. He says, don't go astray. Go away from, astray from what? Your commission. You keep to your mission. Don't follow anyone else. Don't go astray with false doctrine and tickling teachings. You stay on course to my commission. What's the commission? This gospel will be preached to all nations. Do not be alarmed when all of this is going on. Stay on point. You know, they teach sharpshooters when you shoot. You get your target on course and you do not veer from it. There's a story of a man who had to re-up his license every year as a sharpshooter. And uh, the one year he was going back, he had to get uh, eyeglasses, spectacles as he was getting older. He was quite a marksman. And as he was laying there ready to practice to, to uh, actually perform his test on sharpshooting, he knelt down with his glasses. And as he was setting up scope and he knew he got his bead on the target, he exhaled so that he would stay steady and it fogged up all his glasses. But he remembered one thing. You stay the course. He didn't panic. He wasn't alarmed. He didn't move. He pulled the trigger and hit it on the bullseye. Oh, there'll be wars, rumors of wars. Your glasses will get fogged. There'll be things that distract you. There'll be persecution against you. But you don't stray from the command. What is the command of the church? What is the commission of the church? To take this gospel to all nations. To preach at all times. Amen? Amen. That's what we're called to do in these days. He then goes and says there'll be more signs. But let me cover this one statement. It's a bit odd. He says, A brother will deliver a brother unto death, a father, his child, and children. Against parents, they'll be put to death. And you who will be hated by my, for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. What does that mean? Well, it means the one who gets through all of this difficulty will be saved and born again. No, that doesn't make sense, does it? He says that there's other Christians who will be betrayed by brothers and parents and children. Aren't they saved? Aren't they saved too? But they were killed for their faith. Don't they get to get saved? Well, they have to endure till the end. Well, what's the end? But see, that's the problem with the word saved here. The word saved is sozo. It means salvation, born again, but it also simply means delivered. And so the simple statement is this, but the one who endures to the end will be delivered. Yeah, that's pretty basic, isn't it? If you make it through this period of time, you'll be delivered. That's how simple that statement is. There will be many Christians who lose their life at this time of tribulation. They will be turned in by brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles. Even their own children will turn against them. We see it in India. We see it in Pakistan. We see it in China. We see it in Africa. We see it all over the earth. This is happening regularly. What makes the Christian church in the Western world think that we're going to escape that? Because we're special. Because we're Americans and God loves America. Come on. This is across the board for everyone. 
But there will be those who will endure the tribulation, those who are preaching and teaching, those who have not been martyred, who will make it through, and they will be what? Delivered. Christ is returning. Those who died will come with him. Those who are alive will go up to him. That's what he's saying. And so he goes on with another sign, and he says this next sign is the temple. But when you see the abomination of desolation, he's referring to Daniel 11.31, and he says this abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be. It's a person. The abomination unto desolation standing where he ought not to be. Let the reader understand. That's the ultimate false messiah. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor either his house or take anything out of it. And let the one who is in the field not turn back or take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. But pray that it may not happen in winter. When you see these things happen, When you see the abomination of desolation, hmm, that's interesting. That happens three and a half years into the tribulation. Huh. Who's he talking to? The church, his disciples. And he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, oh, I guess we're going to be there. So when you see this occurring in the three and a half years into this, the abomination of desolation, he says, you need to get out of Jerusalem. You need to get out of there quick. All right. Now this is interesting in history because this has already taken place on a number of occasions. There have been two abominations of desolations. One in 167 when Antiochus Epiphanes came into Jerusalem. He destroyed the temple, set up a, a, a statue of Zeus, and offered a pig on the altar in the temple. The abomination of desolation. But that's not the fulfillment of of Daniel because Jesus here says well after that time period that there is coming an, a, another abomination of desolation. So what he's talking about is when Titus, the Roman emperor, came in to Jerusalem in 70 AD, just 40 years after he taught this lesson. See, Rome was sick and tired of Israel, that thorn in their side. They were fed up with these Jews. They said, we're done with them. We're getting rid of them all. And so Titus came and brought the Roman army against Israel surrounding Jerusalem. And guess what happened in 66 AD when Rome came against Jerusalem? Guess who ran for the hills when Rome surrounded Jerusalem? Not the Jews. The Christians. Now what gave them the mind to figure out we should head for the hills when we see Rome entering into war against Jerusalem. The prophecy of Jesus that they just heard. They knew this prophecy when they saw Rome coming in. The Christians escaped the destruction of Rome because of this prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they headed for the hills. But the Jews didn't. They couldn't give up their temple. It's where God was, as they understood. And so they held out. Rome said, give up, people. Give up, you stiff-necked Jews. They said, no, they wouldn't. Finally, the Romans were furious. They came into the city, and they just destroyed everything. The Jews in that city who were not slaughtered ran into the temple to hide. The Romans were so furious, they wanted to keep the temple, but they decided just to burn it. They burned it, and it caught on fire, and the flame was crazy and it began to melt all the gold on the tiles of the roof and the gold implanted in the stones and the the fire was so ferocious it began to melt the gold which then melted and trickled in between all the great stones you can read this through josephus the historian and what the romans decided to do after they destroyed the jews and the temple is they said i want you to take this temple down block by block to retrieve the gold for Rome. And as Jesus prophesied, not one stone will remain upon another, the Romans deconstructed that temple to get at the gold that had melted in it and fulfilled the prophecy of Jesus. But 
This is not the final abomination of desolation. But why not? There's no more Jews. You remember Jesus cursed the fig tree and there was nothing from this nation for 2,000 years. We see nothing from Israel. But Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4, that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God and that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That was written after 70 AD, and so there is an abomination of desolation coming for the end times. And that's what Jesus was pointing to. The ultimate, when Antichrist would come and enter into the temple and establish himself as Messiah and God. That's in our future. And it's coming. And he says this concerning that, but first there will be a great falling away. Something very interesting, I find it interesting that in this prescription of last days of a church that is on fire and full of zeal for God to win the lost, there's also a great falling away. How can that be? There's only one environment that will create that, persecution. The persecution will come so strong that those who said they were Christians, those who acted like Christians, those that you thought behaved and were Christians, when the rubber meets the road or the fire meets the clothes, they're out of there. There will be a great falling away in the church. But there will be a church pure and spotless, ready to do what it was told to do in this day and in this hour. So it's an interesting time, isn't it, that you're going to see. And these are the times we need to gather together. In fact, he goes on to say, number six, is that there's going to be such deception. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. You see, if the tribulation was in 70 A.D., That was supposed to be the greatest tribulation this planet ever felt. I don't think so. Because 70 AD had no impact on all of creation and the rest of the earth. So there is a tribulation coming that will affect the planet. It will be so ferocious, it is something that has never been seen on the planet before since the beginning of creation. That would include the flood. Perilous times, crazy times. And it will culminate the end. Verse 20, And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved, or again, better rendered, delivered. But for the Lord's sake of the elect whom He chose, He shortened the days. Let me ask you a question. Shortened the days of what? What's the topic here? He shortened the days for whom? The elect. I guess they're there. Right? And so the tribulation is shut close for the sake of the elect whom he chose. He shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ or Messiah, or look, there he is, don't believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to be led astray. If possible, even the elect... But be on guard, I've told you all these things beforehand. Be on guard through what? The tribulation. What are we to be on guard for? Not to be deceived. What is our job? To preach the gospel. The tribulation is the greatest opportunity for the harvest of souls that has ever come on planet earth. This is the church's finest hour. When the church will be unstoppable. The church will be unmoved. You won't be able to stop a Christian. The only way you can stop a Christian from his assignment to witness to all nations is to kill him. Do you get the point? But in the Western society, we say, 
We don't have to worry about that. We're getting out of here. Jesus is removing us before the tribulation comes because we're not supposed to endure any wrath. No, we will not endure the wrath of God. He never promised that you would miss the wrath of man. He, in fact, said you will have tribulation with you always. He's not going to pull the church out when he needs the church most. What do you think the seven years of tribulation is about? Winning souls. It says in Revelation 13 that there is an innumerable, unable to number the souls that were saved in the tribulation. No man can number them. It's a great harvest. He's bringing the sickle in. But what's happening, church? What's happening? He says... What's happening is many Christians are saying, I don't think I need church right now. I don't need to follow through. The church is losing its way to false teachers and cheap gospels. Do you know the average church attender now goes once a month instead of every week? Once a month is average church attendance. Twelve times a year? That's a strong church. We need each other. We've been so offended by each other. We've, we, we're so sick and tired of church politics. We're tired of church leadership. We don't like each other. Come on, people. Who's going to get this job done? The disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why there's going to be a great falling away. And when all of this comes and he says, keep your eye on me, don't be afraid, endure, and don't be swept away, the rest of the church who misses what they expect as a rapture is going to be pretty disillusioned. A deception so great on planet earth that even the very elect could be, but will not, could be deceived. We need each other more than ever now. You need to know the word of God more than ever now. He goes on now to the last sign and he says this. But in those days after the tribulation. Somebody say that with me. After the tribulation. Okay. The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of God coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then He will send out His angels and gather the elect from all the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Jesus now teaches the rapture. What is Jesus' teaching on the rapture? I had you repeat it. All right, I didn't make this up. What did this verse say? After the tribulation, Christ will return. And those who endure will be what? Delivered. Many will have given their lives, but there will be many who will endure. And what Christ will do at His return, at the last trumpet sound, I'm sorry, which trumpet was it? When do the trumpets start? In the tribulation, right? How how do you get a rapture uh, at the last trumpet before the tribulation even begins? Oh, we'll just leave that alone. All right. It's at the last trumpet, it's at the return of Christ, that Christ comes. And as He's coming in the air uh, to receive... You see, if you have a rapture before the tribulation, you've got two comings of Jesus. You've got Jesus returning to the physical atmosphere of planet Earth, picking up people who were dead and alive, and then going back to heaven for seven years, and then coming back again. The Bible does not describe two returns. It says this, that in the twinkling of an eye, at the blast of the trumpet, we shall be gathered to be with Him in the air. And this is no different than any army as it was coming victoriously into a city. All the residents would go out to the army, greeting them, welcoming them, and walk in with the leaders to celebrate the victory. Jesus is coming. As He comes, the angels go forth, and the rapture occurs. Those who are dead in Christ will rise first. Those 
those who are alive on the earth shall be resurrected, all with new bodies, and we will meet Him in the air to come back to planet earth when He comes and to celebrate His victory over the enemy. Hallelujah. Praise God. That is awesome. That is awesome. So church, we have a job to do. That job is to stay faithful to get this done during the tribulation. I don't want you afraid. He says, don't be afraid. These things are going to happen. But pastor, I might lose your, my life. You're supposed to lose your life now. Why are you delaying this? In fact, it says about those who overcame the enemy during the tribulation that they overcome him by the blood of the lamb. Who wants the blood of the lamb? By the word of your testimony. Who's got a testimony? And then everybody raptures out of this verse right there. There's a third part to this verse. And they love not their lives even unto death. Who loves your not life not unto death? Even unto death. Oh, the hands didn't go up. You gave your life up. It's not yours. And so if God needs to use you to give your life, remember you preach the gospel till someone takes you out. This is the preaching of the, this is the disciples. This is what every apostle did that was on that hill that Jesus taught. And where is the church? Let's go on. I'm concluding. I'm going long, but it's the last days anyways, so. (laughs) Jesus continues and says this, verse 28, from the fig tree learn its lesson. And the fig tree is Israel. As soon as its branches become tender and put out its leaves, you know that the summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Wow, Jesus literally says his words are equal to the scriptures of God. Of course they are. He is the scriptures of God. And he says this, look to the fig tree. Isn't it interesting, just a few days earlier, he cursed the fig tree and said there'd be no fruit from this tree. But then he uses the fig tree again, saying, watch, it's coming back. Isn't it interesting that in 1948, a nation called Israel was rebirthed. And now it is a nation again. Benjamin Netanyahu last week said to every Jew on the planet, It is time for you to now come back to Jerusalem, to Israel. These are the days the fig tree has blossomed. We're in the hour to know that it is the church's job to preach and teach. He says, truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away till all these things take place. Now, that's confusing because what generation? He's talking to the disciples right there in the first century. They're dead. Oh, well, did he mean 70 A.D. when he was preaching? Quite possibly. But we know he's talking about the end times as well. Okay, so Bible scholars say that those who are alive in 1948, when the fig tree blossoms, that generation will not pass before Jesus returns. But a biblical generation's passed since that time. So what do we deal with? Uh, Gleason Archer uh, says this, and I think it's a better interpretation. The word generation can also mean people group. Or nation. What Jesus is saying here, I believe, is truly I say to you, Israel will not pass away till all these things take place. Truly, this nation, we interpreted it generation, but this nation of Israel, as they're looking at the Temple Mount, he says, This nation will not pass away until all these things take place. It's just like Paul said in Romans 11. All of Israel will be saved. Israel will come into fruition again. And that's when you know, read the season and the times, the end is near. Folks, we're in the end. He concludes with this for his disciples, the last statement. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. What does he say? Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper, stay awake. You don't know when the master's going to return, so stay awake. What's he supposed to do? Do your job. That's the analogy. 
So he goes on, verse 35, Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening, midnight, or when the rooster crows are in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, all who? All his disciples, stay awake! Nudge the guy sleeping next to you. (laughs) Stay awake. Don't you find it interesting that you can read the, the Bible in the headlines daily. You can see Israel is the focal point of all the world right now. You see the persecution of Christians in every headline every day. You see natural disasters going on continually. And what do you see happening in the church? They're leaving in droves, they're asleep, and they don't care. An apathy, a sleep, a slumber is over the people of God. How can this be in this hour and in this day? If there's any admonition he gave his disciples, he said it five times in that portion of scriptures. What did he say? Stay awake. What parable did he give about his second coming? The wise and foolish virgins. What did they all do? They fell asleep. But he said the voice came and woke them up. There is coming a wake-up call to the church. And that wake-up call will call all those who are not of him to leave. There'll be a great falling away. But those who are alive with the oil and prepared are going to do what they need to do. What is the task? What are we called to do? What's the commission? Preach the gospel. And when the tribulation comes, preach the gospel. And don't stop preaching the gospel till someone takes you out. And if you make it all the way through, glory, hallelujah, I'll see you there. Amen? We've got a job to do. And we've forgotten that. It's time that God is going to awaken his bride from her slumber to ready herself for her finest hour. Guys, gals, what a privilege to be born in this day, at this hour. This is crazy good. You could have been born, you know, in the 1800s, 1700s, all that. That's now good. You're going to see the glory of God, and the church in its finest hour, and you're going to be used, and you're going to give your life to God to be used as he would have you to use it for souls to be one and the greatest harvest that has ever come to this planet. Amen. Now, he will fulfill your heart's desire while you are ministering your heart to him. And you will enjoy these days for God. Let's bow our heads. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.